don't have to pretend you're looking out of a window. You're really looking out of a window. You don't have to pretend you're riding a horse. You're really riding a horse. You don't have to pretend you're swimming in the ocean. You're really there. It's, I just adore it. I don't even mind getting up at four in the morning to go onto a film set. She is considered the first lady of the Canadian stage. American-born Martha Henry was the first graduate of the National Theatre School, and for the majority of her career she's been closely associated with the Stratford Festival. Not only has she acted and directed there, as well as in television and film, but since 2007 she's been the principal of the Birmingham Conservatory for Classical Theatre Training in Stratford, and that's where we met up with her. Martha, uh, my understanding is that you, you got the bug for acting at a pretty early age. Is that true? Pretty, pretty early. How early? Well, um, I remember, this is a story I've told before, so forgive me if you've heard That's it. That's all right. I remember when I was five, my parents were divorced and I was sent to live with my grandparents. And in my grandparents' house, I think my grandmother was being particularly um, uh, generous toward me, there was a great big trunk in the dining room uh, that my grandmother kept all kinds of things in, mementos from her children when they were little, um, moving up through the trunk into tablecloths and right at the very top, the things that she used daily to set the table. Okay, so like and strata in the, in the that's chair. That's right, yeah. yeah. Okay. Yes, the years of my <laughs> grandmother's life. And she used to let me play in there. And uh, so I would dig around a little bit in the top corner and I would pretend to set the table and then as, I, as the months went on I dug down a bit further and eventually way down in the bottom of the trunk I found what I later knew but did not at that point, I found a script and it was, uh, I remember what it looked like although I don't remember the title of the okay. play and it was a dramatist's play service, they're, they're quite unique and it was colored, I think it was yellow and it had the stripes on it and I opened it up because I, I was reading quite voraciously at that age, but I had never seen anything like this. And I opened it up, and there was a, a girl's name and another girl's name. So it was something like Claire and Priscilla. And I, I read this first page, and I realized that I could be Claire or Priscilla. And that if I was Claire, I could say really mean things to Priscilla, and she might fight back, but I could look at the end of this book, this script, and see that uh, Claire didn't get annihilated for this. She didn't get spanked. She didn't get pushed out of the house. Somehow she found her way through her life, as did Priscilla, if I decided I wanted to be Priscilla. I didn't quite know how the theater worked then, that you didn't get to choose whether you were Claire or Priscilla. And I, although I didn't know what this was, I knew that it held a secret to safety, I guess. I okay. mean, you don't think that way yeah, when, you, when you're five, but I knew that I had been displaced. I knew that my parents weren't around, and I knew that I didn't know what was going on. And here in my hands, I felt somehow, again, I couldn't have put this into words, right. but I felt that I had the key to knowing the end of the story, knowing how it was going to go, and knowing what my place in it was. And eventually, I discovered that this was a script and that this was something you could actually do. You could actually uh -huh. go to places and you could put on these, what I found out were called plays. Uh, well, I thought this is you know, this is where I'm going. Did you talk to your grandmother about this at all? No. So you kept oh, it to no, yourself. Oh no! Oh, it was my secret. Oh, I see. It was okay. a big secret, I thought. Yeah. So, so at what age did you actually start doing something about that? Well, then when I was seven, I joined the Brownies because they did a play. Okay. I didn't care much about twirling sticks and making fire or any of those things, but they did a play, and I had I happened to have a blue gauzy dress that my mother had brought uh, for me on one of her visits and it was to dress up in but I knew the play that they were doing was about a fairy and that if I had a costume I could probably be the fairy so I joined the brownies and I told them I had a costume and that I wanted to be in the play and that I wanted to play the fairy and they said that was fine they let me do that so you're seven at that point yeah 
and, you, and the the hook is already in you. Oh yeah, yeah. You knew you knew right away that that's exactly what that you wanted to do. That was exactly for the rest of your what life. that was the only thing I wanted to do, and my life was spent trying to find out how to do that and where to do that. Yeah. My grandfather would take me to the movies, and the movies were I could get in for twelve cents. That's how long ago that was, <laughs> and so I would run around the house and I would find two pennies, and then I would go to my grandfather and I would say, I have two. If you can give me the third one, then I can go to the movies. So he would have to give me the dime. I mean, I thought I was being so clever, I'm sure, pulling the wool over his eyes. But he knew exactly, of course, what I was up to. Do you remember what kind of movies you were going to see? Oh, everything. everything. There was one movie theater in, this was Greenville, Michigan. There was one movie theater. And uh, Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday, they had the big MGM musicals. The, um, Thursday and Friday, they'd have a film noir and Saturday and Sunday would be the Western. Wow. So, so you got the whole cross-section of oh all yeah. that stuff. Yeah. Which of those appealed to you the most? Oh, all of them. I didn't all care. All of them? Oh, yeah. I didn't okay. care. Even all the Westerns? Them. Yeah, I wasn't quite as interested in the Westerns, yeah. I guess, but no, no, I, yeah. everything. Now, you, you went back, you moved back with your mother when you were in your teens, did you mm -hmm. not? How old were you then? Uh, I think I must have been 14. Okay. I was, it was when I started high school. Okay, so this was still in Michigan? Yeah. Yeah. And now, how, how strange an adjustment was that, or was it? Well, it, it, it was an adjustment in that I left all my friends, of course, and yeah. I started a new school. But I was back with my mother, so I was thrilled about that. And she had a, an apartment that I loved, and a piano, and, you know, she had, there were lots of good things about yeah. it. I was very shy, and so it was hard for me to make friends in the new school. It was an all-girls school. But, you know, eventually I found some people yeah. that um, I got along with and um, I had music classes and, and there was a, they had a drama group and I was able to join the local um, summer stock theater and so I was fine. I you was were happy. happy. Your mother was a musician, was she not? Yes, she was. So did you confide in her what your passion was? Well, by that time, she pretty well knew. Right. Because by the time I was 14, all I was doing was saying, and can I join the Willoway Playhouse? And where are the classes? And I want to go. And I'd rather do that than go to school. And uh, yeah. Was she supportive? Oh, yes. Being a performer? She, she always was, yeah. 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 When she was uh, young, after my parents were divorced that summer, and before I went off to live with my grandparents, I would travel around with her. In fact, most summers uh, when I was out of school, I would go and travel around with her, and she would be, uh, she would do industrial shows and uh, shows throughout Michigan, in which she played the accordion. Usually, sometimes piano, but usually accordion because it was transportable. Right. And while she was on stage. Uh, I would be looked after by the snake charmers and the ventriloquists and the acrobats and all the other people who were in the show. And so I loved them. And they treated me like a, a real person. They didn't yeah. treat me like a stupid little girl, which I certainly was. So that, would be, um, so that I guess, w in, in a way, was the backdrop against which, when you picked up that script at the age of five, you already had a sense that there was another... Universe well, out there. Uh, not really. No? no, my my mother, as long as my mother and father were married, my mother was a. Um, I can't exactly say housewife. My mother never quite fit that description, but uh, she played the piano. She had piano lessons mm. until the day she died, uh, and so I would hear her playing the piano at night when I went to sleep. But it was a very ordered household. Okay. Uh, there were no shenanigans at all. Yeah. So it was when I was five that the whole world changed. Shifted. Yeah. How did you end up in Canada? They had a place called the Stratford Festival. And I thought, any country that can create that, that's where I want to be. So when I graduated from university, I went to Carnegie Tech, which is now Carnegie Mellon. Mm -hmm. Um, I, I wanted to be here somehow. And during the summers, I had been, I had been working in summer stock in Leamington, Ontario. They had a, a place called the Sun Parlor Playhouse. I think it's still there. And um, during the summers that I was there, I was there about three summers, it was run by a man named Larry Johnson who had directed 
me at Willoway Playhouse, and he had a chum named George C. Scott who was in the, the that, plays that there. George that George C. Scott. That very George okay. C. Scott. Mm -hmm. And uh, we did, I worked there for three years while I was still in school. Okay. Now so I got to know Canadian actors. Right. And, uh, and a relatively small community, too. Yes. Still yeah. is, I think. Yeah. 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 Um, but you ended up going to the National Theatre School at its inception. Mm -hmm. Is that right? Mm -hmm. Tell me about that. How did that come about? That came about because um, after I graduated from university, I moved to Toronto. And I went to auditions. I auditioned for the CBC. I auditioned for the Crest Theatre um, uh, on Mount Pleasant in Toronto, which was run by the Davises, by Murray Davis, actually. Mm -hmm. And I got a job there. And so I was at the Crest all year. And in that company was Paulus Thomas. And Paulus, at that time, was about to take over the National Theatre School. He was about to start mm -hmm. the National Theatre School. And so he would go off from time to time. He would leave rehearsals and he would go out on an audition tour. And he would come back from the audition tour and he would say, I'd say, oh, how did the audition tour go? Because, of course, I was very interested in this. Yeah new school that he was starting. And he'd say, oh, it was uh, amazing. We saw this extraordinary girl, hair down to here, bare, she came in barefoot. She'd never had an acting lesson in her life. She's brilliant. We're taking her. I said, oh, brilliant. <laughs> he'd never mentioned the boys. Right? And then the, the next time he went out, he'd come back. I said, how was it? Oh, we saw this phenomenal girl, uh, raised in a convent, um, hair down to here, came in in bare feet. She's brilliant. We're taking her. We can't teach her anything. We're taking her. So this happened often enough so that finally I said, where are you getting all these amazing girls? And he said, well, you can come. I just, and I said, well, I, I can't come. I've already been through school. I, I graduated from Carnegie Tech. It was a full university program. I'm now out in the world. And Paulus, who was a very clever gentleman, smiled and said, well, think about it. So I thought about it, and I thought, well, I was 21 at the time, and I thought, if I go to the National Theatre School, I will be 22. It's a three-year program. I'll be 25 when I get out. I expect when I'm 40 and look back, 25 won't seem all that old. Maybe this is something I should do. So I told him I would like to go, and uh, Jean Gascon, who was the head of the school, um, came to Toronto and auditioned me. In other words, we sat in a room, and he said, you really love this, don't you? Because he'd seen the show that I was in. I see. Okay. And I said, oh, sure. <laughs> <laughs> and he said, fine, we'll take you. So there I was at the National Theatre School, and uh, I was there a year and a half. Yeah, you didn't make it all the way through, did you? No, I but didn't. But you graduated. I, yes, he graduated me, yeah. <laughs> Not bad. <laughs> Not bad. I got an offer from Stratford uh, when I was halfway through my second year, and I went to Paulus and I said, I realize I can't take it because I still have another year and a half to go. But um, I've had an offer from Stratford, and this is what it is. And he said, take it. You'll learn more in the year and a half, in a year and a half there, than you will in a year and a half here. Okay. Do you remember the, the feelings you had when that offer from Stratford came? Because this was the place, as you say, that you were interested oh, in yes. all along. Yeah. That had to be pretty cool. Yeah. I, well, I knew I could never work here. I just knew it was way beyond my, my grasp. But just to be in the same vicinity, you know, I thought that was pretty pretty good. But the theater school came to Stratford in its two months supposedly off. And we, um, we're in, sitting in Stratford right now in, uh, in a, a beautiful little restaurant. And just down the street there is the high school where we had our classes during the summer. And we'd sit out on the hill or we'd be inside if it was raining. And then the actors from the festival would come and speak to us. We got to go and see all the shows as many times as we wanted, as long as it wasn't full. So I saw Zoe Caldwell play Rosaline in, in Love's Labor's Lost. I saw Schofield play Coriolanus and Don Armado in Love's Labor's Lost. Um, Douglas Rain, we saw all these great, great 
astonishing actors. And they kind of got to know us, too. So that turned out to be my audition for Stratford, because yeah. we did our final presentation on the Stratford Festival stage. What was that like? Oh, it was great. I oh, bet. it was wonderful. We did Macbeth. We did scenes from Macbeth, spanning the whole course of the play. And so I got to play Lady Macbeth in one of the scenes. And Michael Langham was there. He came to, to see it. And so that was my audition. Were you, do you remember being nervous about that? Were you on tender hooks? Oh, I'm sure I was. But no, I don't remember being nervous. I just remember it being extraordinary. Yeah. Glorious, yeah. The, uh, I've always been intrigued by the fact that, well, we mentioned earlier that it's a small, the, the stage acting community is a fairly small community, um, though I, I've always suspected that even if it wasn't a small community in numbers, that you would all know each other anyway. Um, over the course of your career, I'm sure many people have been intimidated by you and your prowess at acting, but do you remember <laughs> seeing some of those people in your early days and going, Oh my God! I'll never be as good as that. Did you ever have that doubt at all, or that concern? Um, I I don't know if it formulates itself quite that way. When I was ten years old, I saw Helen Hayes on stage, and as far as I was concerned, because Helen Hayes was a very small woman, yes. there was no difference between Helen Hayes and me when I was ten, except that she was a bit older than I was. <laughs> But other than that, I, I think I always thought of myself as a member of that community. The, okay, so you consider yourself one of them. Does that, I've, I've seen you in other interviews talk about the idea of confidence, that it's probably the most important thing that an actor needs to have. Mm. You seem to have had it right from the beginning. Oh, not always. No? No, no not always. No, you, you get thrown by all kinds of things. And of course you get nervous. Um, but very often the nervousness is a, is a preliminary to a kind of exhilaration mm -hmm. which takes over because something has to take over. You can't function if you're just nervous. Yeah. I've uh, seen other performers, and uh, not just actors, but people who, you know, comedians, and I've talked to a number of people like this, who are very good at what they do but have, have said to me, there are times when just just before the curtain opens or just before they're introduced and they have to go on or just before they're thinking to themselves I can't do this I just can't do this and then but they know they have to and then once they do everything changes hmm. do you feel that way sometimes too like oh sometimes. god I have to do this again and yet when you get out there it's all different yes yeah, so well I think you I think when you're on stage the the time you feel that most is somewhere around the third week of rehearsals and you think, right, now, what else could I do? I'm sure there's some profession that would take me in which I could make a meaningful contribution because clearly this, what I'm doing right now, <laughs> is not it. And I shouldn't be taking up this space. Yeah. And I always think, I go to this shoe store in Stratford that, you know, I'd be really good <laughs> selling shoes in Stratford. And, I, and you absolutely believe it because you can't, you can't break through. You can't figure it out. You yeah. can't put it together. You, and you think, why, why, why am I doing this? Yeah. I'm clearly dreadful at it. And, of course, sometimes you are dreadful at it. <laughs> what about, uh, tell me about your relationship with directors, because I've always been curious about that relationship between actors and directors. There is, I mean, you're, they're, they're directing you and everything, but then at a certain point, it has to be you. It's all you. What, what has your relationship been with different directors over the years? Some well, better than others? Oh, sure, yeah. yes. Um, I've always been very lucky with directors. I've had extraordinary, astonishing directors and directors that, um, that I revered, um, starting with uh, a man who taught me when I was in my teens. Uh, he was a wonderful theater director and he was a, a teacher as well and um, then of course Michael Langham well Paulus Thomas we've already mm -hmm. yeah we've already talked about um, Michael Langham here at Stratford was an astonishing director and uh, and tough he was hard 
and I was playing Cressida for him. It was the, my second year here, and I had to audition for Cressida. Um, and he, I remember we had one day when I, I just I couldn't get whatever it was he wanted, and I was standing on the, the uh, what do you call tumpty, which are little stools, okay. up in front of the center pillar, and we were watching uh, Cressida with her uncle Pandrus. Uh, were watching the soldiers as they went uh, supposedly in front of our eyes through the audience. And Cressida was very excited seeing all these gorgeous young men jumping up and down. And I couldn't get what Michael wanted. And he was quite brusque, as he always was. He didn't waste any time. And he would bark things at me as he was moving on to do something else. And I was determined not to cry. I will not cry. I will not cry. I will do this. I will get through this. I will give him what he wants. I, I'm going to do this. I'm damned if I'm going to cry. And at one point, uh, just near the end of rehearsal, when he went by, he'd said something particularly um, devastating. Okay. <laughs> All right. And just as he went by, he took my hand and squeezed it. And, of course, then I was gone. I just wept tears. I would have been fine if he hadn't said, hang on there, you know, yeah, this yeah. is just the process. I'm with you. you know? So uh, that was that was pretty. And then I cried for the rest of the day. <laughs> oh, dear, the dear. rest of the okay. day. <laughs> All right. Well, see, that, now that just astonishes me because I always, I always thought, and maybe this is, just the way, this is just my personality, but I've always just assumed that the best way to get a good performance out of actors is to actually kind of work with them and you know, be be specific and tell them what you want. And the idea of being hard and barking at people seems kind of counterintuitive. That's changed a lot. I would say the thing that's changed the most in the theater that I can see is that kind of attitude. Yeah. But the, it was there were very very few female directors, for instance. I'm not saying all male directors were like this. They weren't. Uh, and Michael couldn't have gotten away with it if he wasn't so good. But he was such a wonderful, specific director. And you knew that he had studied the play intimately. He knew the play way better than you ever would. He knew your part way better than you ever would. And he was asking for things that worked. He was asking for specificity. He was asking for complete involvement, total concentration. Yeah. All those things you knew were right, yes. and you were trying to, to give them to, to him. However, that kind of, of direction, there was a, a director named Derek Goldby, again, a wonderful director, but harsh. And uh, that began to change when equity got involved because there started to be complaints ah. about these kinds of directors. And I have to say, at that particular time, they were all men. I don't, I mean, I know they, that all men are not like that, and I've known some pretty nasty female directors, too. So this is not a, a sweeping statement by any means. But these um, gentlemen who were brought up in an old school, I mean, there was a director named John Dexter that I never worked with, but apparently was brutal. I mean, just mean to, to people. And I've known a few others, too. Yeah. Um, but that was that was the way you did it. It was you. People didn't think they could be directors unless they could be yes. authoritative, and yes. therefore they had to show that they were boss, and they had to make sure that no one spoke back to them, and no one contradicted them, and that they were always on top of it. That was just the way you functioned. Yeah, um, there. At some point, I think, as an actor, certainly you must. I mean, if the director, if you can't get what the director wants, at what point do you determine, well, it's not, it's not me anymore, it's him. He's just not, he or she aren't explaining this properly. I mean, have you ever reached that point where you think, well, there's something not right here and I know it's not me? <laughs> well, you always kind of suspect it might be you. Yeah, of course. <laughs> um, and uh, I mean, we talk about this in the conservatory. I run the conservatory at the, yeah. the Stratford Festival. We talk about this in the conservatory from time to time because, you know, it doesn't really matter what you think about the director as far as your involvement is concerned. Obviously, it's better if you and the director get along. Obviously, it's better if you respect the director. But even if you don't, 
There isn't any point in digging your heels in, flexing your muscles and saying, you're a jerk, I know better than you, only because it shows up on stage. And the example I use is a production of Macbeth that was done here at the theater. This was many, many years ago. I knew nothing about the rehearsal process. I wasn't in the show. But when I went to see it, I thought, there's something wrong here. These actors don't agree with this production. And it was perfectly clear really? that that was what had happened. Huh. And it continued all the way through the show. You could see, I mean, almost literally see a divide between what the actors were doing and what the director was after. Now, it may be that the director was a fool and all the actors were smart. It doesn't make any difference. It, the show doesn't work. The only way you can make a show work is if everybody's on the same page. However it is, you get there. Now, I've directed actors who don't agree with me, absolutely. Yeah. But I've never had an actor who finally tried to um, undermine the production, ultimately. Finally, they, whether they agree with me or not, they leap on board they do it. only because... For the sake of the play. For the sake of the, yeah. the play and the production. Yeah. Now, you've done film as well. In our last couple of minutes, I wanted to ask you about this. You've done film as well. How, I mean, that's a, is that a different, for you, a different discipline entirely? When it comes well, to being directed and everything else? It's, it's different in that your focus is different, but the process ex is exactly the same. Okay. You're still trying to create a character. You're still living in a situation. I love doing film. I just love it. It, you don't have to pretend you're looking out of a window. You're really looking out of a window. <laughs> you don't have to pretend you're riding a horse. You're really riding a horse. You don't have to pretend you're swimming in the ocean. You're really there. It's, I just adore it. I don't even mind getting up at four in the morning <laughs> to go on to a film set. And the idea of being able to do a number of takes is something that's appealing as well? Yes, I, yes. I have no problem with that. Yeah? Yeah. Um, the One of the things about stage work that's always amazed me, and I've, I've read some actors saying, because they flip back and forth, usually it's film actors, but people who are principally film actors who say this, that they like doing stage work, but after a while they, they just can't keep up the energy level that it takes to go on night after night mm. and keep doing it over and over again. That seems to me to be a special uh, part of a person's constitution to be able to do that and do it successfully that a lot of film actors don't seem to have. It's hard work, isn't it? It is hard work, yeah. And it's a, there's a special kind of technique that you develop uh, to make it fresh every time you do it. Because, of course, if you don't, then there's one audience who hasn't actually seen what it is you want them to see. So you have to, I think this is one of the most difficult things that a stage actor has to learn. You have to find out how to mine that a new every single time you do it. Wow. And you have to keep yourself in shape and you have to have some kind of a ritual that you do before when you know you have a show that day and you have to make sure your voice is, is in tune. You have to make sure you do your exercises, you know. All those things, it's, it's demanding. It's yeah. like being an athlete. It's exhausting just listening to you describe it. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I'm sorry. Well, it's all right. <laughs> I'll go rest now. We've run short of time. This has been fabulous. Thank Thanks, you very much. Thanks so much. It was a, great much. Pleasure. It was a pleasure. You.